9.15. Flight 587 is now at 1,700 feet. The departure controller gives them a navigation fix. New York, American 587, heavy turn left, proceed direct wavy. We'll turn direct wavy, American 587, heavy. One second later, the plane begins to shake. The pilots know the turbulence is likely to have come from the Japan Airlines jumbo up ahead. It's a routine hazard, and Molin flies through it. 250, thank you. The captain increases the speed of the plane to 250 knots, the maximum allowable at that height. But seconds later, the plane hits more turbulence. Sten Molin takes decisive action. Using his foot controls, he applies the rudder first to the right and then to the left to try and stabilize the plane. Back power! Again, Molin asks for more power to keep the aircraft under control. You all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Hang on to it. Hang on to it. Full power, please. Holy. Less than two minutes into their journey, Flight 587 is in deep trouble. The lives of 260 people in the air and many more below are in mortal danger. 89 seconds after takeoff, Flight 587 is in trouble. In the cockpit, co-pilot Sten Molen is fighting the controls. What the hell are we into? I'm stuck in it! Get out of it! Get out of it! Far below, 53-year-old Pete Hayden, deputy chief of the New York Fire Department, is taking his first day off since September 11th. His attention is drawn to a plane making an unusual straining noise. It's struggling. I look up. It's lower in the sky than normal. I'm watching it and the plane suddenly begins to break apart. Holy! I see the back part of the plane behind the left wing break open. Smoke and flames come out. As the plane spins out of control, the engines shear off. Mark Shaw, still trying to wake his son, also hears the plane. And I think that it sounds just like the Concorde. Come on, Jason. You know you have a doctor's appointment today. Come on, get up. The house starts to shake. Pete Hayden watches in disbelief. At 9.16 and 15 seconds, Flight 587 slams into the ground. At 9.20 a.m., a pilot who has seen the crash alerts air traffic control at JFK. Now yeah, look at the south of the aircraft crashing. Say again? An aircraft just crashed to the south of the field. An aircraft crashed south of the field? Aircraft fireball. Controllers see a black pall of smoke over the suburb of Rockaway. On the ground, an amateur cameraman captures the horrifying scene. Plane crashed. Where? Into the houses. Houses are crushed and burning. Aircraft parts are everywhere. The whole neighborhood seems to be under attack. One of the first at the scene is Deputy Fire Chief Pete Hayden. There are bodies everywhere, all over the streets, in the yards. Some victims still strapped into the seats of the airplane. For Pete Hayden, the scene is all too familiar. It's 9-11 all over again. Only this time, it's his own neighborhood that has been hit. I'm wondering who it is that I know today that was killed. As the full scale of what has happened becomes apparent, residents are in a state of shock. The engine fall down and the, the belly fall, the piece then left side and make it straight all the way down. From across New York, emergency services race to Rockaway. 
Among them, Inspector Michael Morley, who is horrified to hear the plane has crashed close to his own home. His first thought is for his son and his mother-in-law. I know my son is at home. I know my mother-in-law is in the house. So I'm panicking like every other father. You know, I'm thinking, oh my God, what if my kid's killed? What if, I don't know what's going on with my family. Michael Morley's next door neighbor, Lois Shaw, is traveling to work when she gets a terrifying call from her husband, Mark. What's gone, the house? He's screaming hysterically, the house is burning down. So I, I just totally freak out and I'm trying to scream, where's Jason, what's happening? But we get disconnected at this moment. Horrified, Lois heads home. News of the disaster spreads across the city. Roger, I'll have to cut you off. Uh, we are just learning from Associated Press that there has been a plane crash in Queens. Hector Algaroba is having breakfast in a diner, having left his parents at the airport. The word that we have is that it is an American Airlines jet. Is an American Airlines jet. Is an American Airlines jet. He's not certain which flight his parents caught, but his blood runs cold. Hundreds of firefighters from across the city are now fighting the blaze. Mayor Giuliani arrives to see the damage for himself. We'll do everything we can to help these people, everything. And the president is on top of it. They're alert. They're watching everything else all over the country. So I think people should remain absolutely calm. But New Yorkers believe they are being attacked again. The city is in meltdown. The Empire State Building is evacuated the United Nations is in partial lockdown. Airports are closed, and all civil aircraft are grounded. Armed F-15 Eagles scramble, and other jets are on strip alert around the country. Tunnels and bridges are closed. The city is gridlocked. Americans fear their worst nightmare is unfolding once more. The plane has crushed four houses on the intersection of Newport Avenue and Beach 131st Street. Across the road, five more houses are ablaze. One of these belongs to police inspector Michael Morley. When he arrives at the scene, he is horrified. There is no sign of either his baby son or his mother-in-law. On his doorstep, two of his own officers are waiting for him. Is anybody left inside? My mother-in-law was babysitting Mikey. Because I said, my son's in the house. And they said, we looked, there's nobody in there. They thought <coughs> that maybe I was in there sleeping also. Uh, so I said, well, did you look good? And they said, yes. As rescue vehicles race to the scene, roads into Rockaway are gridlocked. Lois Shaw battles desperately to get back to her family and home. I had no idea what, what I was going to find or what had happened, but I was thinking that I just have to get to my house. I have to get to my house. Michael Morley is in a desperate situation. His own loved ones are lost in the heart of the raging inferno, yet he's also the officer in charge of the scene. I'm just a regular guy, and all of a sudden you're the highest ranking police officer on the scene of a major catastrophe like this. I knew in a little while the whole police department's gonna start responding and everybody's gonna come and be helping out, but for right now, I'm in charge. What do you do? Desperate to find her son, Lois Shaw abandons her car. She runs towards her burning house until she comes to a police cordon. That's my house! I've got to get in there! I've got to get Four policemen, I remember, holding me back, and I was screaming, let me go, my son is in the house, let me go. No, no, my son is in there! My son is in there! No, please let me through! Michael Morley still has no idea what has happened to his own family. When senior police chiefs arrive, they hear his baby son and mother-in-law are missing. And one of the chiefs says, hey, Mike, what are you still doing here? I said, I'm just trying to help out, boss. And he says, get out of here, go find your family. I said, all right. More and more people desperate for information arrive at the scene of the tragedy. Among them, Hector Algaroba. He believes his parents were on the plane, but he's praying for a miracle. The hope was somehow all the smoke and all the fire that I'm seeing is from some sort of impact of the plane trying to land and there has been a lot of people that survive i'm trying to cling to whatever hope because the last thing a human being loses in life is hope in the middle of the carnage lois shore is still looking for her family i'm running 
to see if Jason is alive, and I feel unreal. All I see ahead of me is smoke. I can't see anything. Michael Morley races frantically from house to house, desperately hoping his loved ones will be sheltering with a neighbor. Eleanor! Anybody who's a parent, you, you lose your kid in a, a Kmart or a Walmart or something like that, and you just get that panic and your stomach goes into knots and you start sweating, you're getting nervous, and you don't want to think the worst, but you can't think of it, and then just magnify that by, you know, a hundred times because a plane crash just was right on your house. Jason, answer me, Mark! Then, Lois Shaw hears the shout she's longing for. And I looked, and that's when I saw Jason and Mark. Lois! Lois, we're over here! Once I saw him alive, that was, at that moment, that was all that I really cared about. Nothing else really mattered. Oh my God, are you okay? Oh, Jason! Oh, Jason and his father are alive and well. They got out of the house with seconds to spare. Oh my God, thank God! Oh, thank God, you're okay. Give her a big hug, she was a crying. That's when she, and then she was like, what, are you okay, are you okay? I was like, like, I didn't really have any emotions. It was just good to be together. A block away, Michael Morley is still frantically searching when a neighbor calls him over. Hey, Mike, get over here! God, to the right of there, to the right of there! I saw him. Uh -huh. it, it was a fantastic feeling, because I, two seconds earlier, I'm starting to panic, thinking maybe they really were dead, and you turn around, and there they were. My son was crying when he saw me, and I, you know, you get worked up when your son's crying, and like my eyes started getting wet. But I just held him for about five minutes. But for each moment of joy, there are a hundred of despair. Stan Molin, father of the co-pilot, gets a phone call with devastating news. I told him that call came in. You can sort of, you know, hope that it was a different airplane, but. Uh... That, that, that was uh, the, oh no, this can't be, moment. In the Dominican Republic, relatives expecting a family reunion at the Santo Domingo airport are suddenly confronted with an appalling reality. Their loved ones are dead. Hector cannot leave until he knows what has happened to his parents. He waits, hoping desperately. With the fire under control, the body count and identification of victims is underway. Mayor Giuliani holds a press conference. We have uh, so far um, recovered 132 bodies. And as, I, and as the governor said, there were 255 uh, people and crew members uh, that were listed on the manifest and uh, I want to again express my sympathy and condolences to everyone involved. After the announcement, Giuliani meets the bereaved families and personally gives Hector the news he is dreading. He hugged me and gave me his condolences by telling me that my parents were on that flight. It's just two months and one day since 9-11. The parallels with America's worst terrorist outrage are striking. America looks to the White House for answers. At 12 p.m., White House Press Secretary Harry Fleischer makes a statement. First information is always subject to change. We have not ruled anything in, not ruled anything out. Then President Bush interrupts a meeting with Nelson Mandela to make a statement. We sent our FEMA teams over. The FBI is over there. And this investigation is being led by the National Transportation Safety Board to, to make sure that the facts are, are, are fully known to the American people. How did Flight 587 end in catastrophe? Why did one of the most reliable aircraft in service break up in midair and come crashing down on a residential suburb? We knew we had a long row ahead of us because we still had no idea why the vertical stabilizer really came off. Then, just as the investigation seems to have stalled, comes a vital turning point. 
Information from the damaged flight data recorder has at last been retrieved. I was very, very relieved. But no one is prepared for the startling picture that the flight data recorder will give. The focus of the entire investigation suddenly shifts from the machine to the man flying it, co-pilot Sten Molen. 83 seconds after takeoff, the recorder shows that Molen applied five extreme movements of the rudder, causing the plane to lurch violently from side to side. The plane slips sideways to its direction of travel, first one way and then the other. I've looked at a lot of flight data readouts in my time. I've never, ever seen that particular type of activity occur. They realize that traveling at nearly 470 kilometers per hour, the aerodynamic stresses on the 130-ton Airbus would have been extraordinary. They were virtually unprecedented to us. We were amazed. It seems as though on the fifth movement of the rudder, the entire tail fin broke off. The implication is extraordinary. Simply by manipulating the controls, the pilot broke the aircraft. The NTSB is so concerned, they take immediate action. On February 8, 2002, they issue a special warning to all pilots of this new danger. But the board have yet to prove that the tail came off simply due to aerodynamic forces. Many pilots doubt that such a thing is possible. The only way to be sure is to run detailed computer simulations, a process which could take months to perform. If the theory is right, then the idea that a terrorist plot must be behind the tragedy can finally be laid to rest. Benzon now faces a new and disturbing mystery. Why did the pilot act in this way? Investigators believe they are close to uncovering the cause of the tragic crash of Flight 587. The flight data recorder shows that the co-pilot, Sten Molen, applied five rapid inputs to the aircraft's rudder pedals, which could have overstressed the tail fin, causing it to break off completely. Now the question is, why would he do such a thing? They listen again to the cockpit voice recorder. We're supposed to be five miles by the time we're airborne. One possible theory is wake turbulence. Wake turbulence is all too familiar to accident investigators. It's a region of spinning air left behind as a plane passes. These vortices can sometimes turn a following plane upside down. But the team quickly realized that this cannot be the cause of the crash. The turbulence was not strong enough to seriously affect a plane the size of the Airbus. The bigger the airplane, the less effect wake turbulence has on it. The A300 is a pretty big airplane. Then comes evidence which changes everything. The investigation team interview Molan's friends and colleagues, and they discover a vital piece of information. A pilot and former colleague recalls an earlier trip with Molan. During an encounter with turbulence, he used the rudder aggressively, even though there was no apparent risk to the plane. The evidence is conclusive. Molin had reacted in the same way before. When those uh, pilots came forward and told us about the first officer's propensity to overreact on the rudders. That was a eureka moment for us. But the revelations don't stop there. When questioned at the time, Molin said he had been taught, trained to use the rudder in this way by American Airlines. If this is true, it raises serious concerns for Benzon and the team. One would assume that if, if many pilots go through, through the same training program with some flaws in it, then a lot of pilots have wrong ideas about how to fly uh, an airplane. With 712 planes in service with American Airlines, Benzon must quickly establish where the truth lies. The airline confirms one of their programs does indeed teach pilots to use the rudder to recover from unusual situations, 
as seen in this training video. And if you don't put that rudder in, what's going to happen? When you get to this portion of the roll, she's going to slice out just like that. Next, Benzon looks at the other tools used to train the pilots, particularly the high-tech flight simulators. Here, pilots are taught to react to a range of emergencies, including wake turbulence. In one of those scenarios, Benzon discovers that the pilots learned to use the rudder very aggressively. The flight simulator program had even been altered to encourage the use of the rudder, particularly when the plane was banking to the right or the left. Airbus themselves had already written to the airline, saying this practice was a cause for concern. The classroom work uh, told pilots that it was permissible to use the rudder to escape from uh, unusual attitude situations. And perhaps more importantly, in the simulator, uh, they were taught to use the rudder very, very aggressively to recover from unusual attitudes. The finding causes controversy. At a public hearing, American Airlines claim that Airbus had not explained there were limits to the use of the rudder. I didn't know you couldn't do that. You couldn't do what? Sorry. Be aggressive with the controls. The airline also claims that the rudder system on the aircraft was very sensitive and that pilots might not be aware how much rudder they were really applying. The NTSB investigate and discover the rudder control system is highly sensitive. What's more, the controls of the plane become more sensitive as the plane increases speed. On the ground, the rudder pedal has to be depressed by 10 centimeters to get maximum deflection. But when flying at high speed, that distance reduces to just 4 centimeters. NTSB officials are shocked to find that this system is not explained in training manuals. There was an apparent uh, gap between what the manufacturers knew about the rudder sensitivity of the airplane and what was filtering down to the folks that actually flew them. Then finally come the results from the analysis of Molin's five rudder inputs. They confirm what nobody really wants to believe, that it's indeed possible to tear the tail fin from an aircraft in flight by stamping violently on the foot pedals. Now Benzen and the team can see exactly what happened to Flight 587. Step by step, they have pieced together the key events that led to the tragedy. Five minutes to disaster. Flight 587 awaits clearance for takeoff as a Japanese 747 airliner takes off. 30 seconds later, Flight 587 is given a warning of wake turbulence. Two minutes to disaster, Flight 587 takes off. Positive rate, gear up, please. One minute to disaster, 587 encounters turbulence for the first time. Sten Molen flies through it. 30 seconds to disaster, 587 hits a second, larger wave of turbulence. The plane is now banking to the left, reminding Molin of his simulator training. Rudder movement! Not realizing how sensitive the rudder system becomes in flight, Molin stamps on the pedal, causing maximum rudder deflection. The plane swings violently to the right, placing enormous loads on the tail fin. Investigators believe that an astonished Molin thinks that the plane is reacting to the wake turbulence. He doesn't realize that his own use of the rudder causes the violent movement. Molin immediately slams the rudder pedal into the opposite position. The plane now swings violently back to the left, placing another enormous load on the tail. Both Molin and States believe the plane is somehow caught in the turbulence. What the hell are we into? I'm stuck in it! Get out of it! And in a desperate attempt to get control, Molin applies another rudder input, this time to the right. Now, thoroughly disorientated, Molin again applies full rudder. 587 is now on the brink of disaster. Finally, on the fifth rudder input, 
all six lugs connecting the tail to the fuselage tear apart. The plane is now doomed. Terrified passengers and crew can have no idea what is happening. Huge G-forces rip both engines away. 106 seconds after takeoff, Flight 587 falls from the sky. 265 people are dead. Important lessons have been learned from the tragedy. Airbus have issued a bulletin reminding pilots how to use the rudder, and American Airlines have modified their training program. Together with the NTSB, the aviation industry has moved to ensure that such a terrible accident will never happen again.